it's October. That can only mean one thing. Here in the United States, it's time for ghouls, ghosts, goblins, trick-or-treating, scary movies. It's time for Halloween. But even better than Halloween is a brand new Ubuntu release, which happens every October. Actually, it happens every April and October. But October of 2019 brings us Ubuntu 1910, which was actually released today. And I wanted to create a new video to show you guys all about it. Now, whether or not you guys are seeing this on release day actually depends on how long it takes me to get this edited. I generally take a day or two, but um, all things considered, it's time for Ubuntu 1910. And I have already created two videos on my channel. I have an installation video, which I'll put a card right here. So that video will show you guys how to install this release. And then I also have a review card right here. And that basically gives you my opinions about this release in general. But I wanted to create more of an overview video that basically shows the entire distribution because it's really hard to cover everything in one review. And then we also have, you know, beginners who might not understand what Ubuntu is. So I want to basically give an overview that would cater to those individuals, but also um, maybe have a little bit for everyone. I'm going to show you Ubuntu 1910. I'm going to leave my opinions out of it because I did put my opinions in the review. And I'm going to show you basically all the components of this new release. So let's go ahead and dive back into Ubuntu 1910. So here we are. This is the default desktop of Ubuntu 1910. And Ubuntu comes in different flavors. So what I'm showing you here is standard Ubuntu. This is the version you get when you go to ubuntu.com and you click on the download link and then you download it. This is what you're going to get. Now there's other flavors of Ubuntu that are basically a play on the word Ubuntu. We have Zubuntu with an X which has XFCE, then we have Kubuntu, which has KDE, and then Ubuntu Mate, which has the Mate desktop environment. All those different flavors of Ubuntu are still Ubuntu, but they have a different user interface. So this is specifically for standard Ubuntu. It's not called Ubuntu GNOME, even though GNOME is the desktop environment. They did actually have a Ubuntu GNOME distribution at one point, but that's been consolidated. Now, normal Ubuntu uses the GNOME interface, so that's what I'm gonna go over in this video. Now, specifically, we have GNOME 3.34, which as of the time I'm recording this video, that is the latest release. So what is the GNOME desktop? So without going into too much detail about all the different desktop environments, GNOME is a modern, that's what it's considered, a modern desktop environment. And the term modern has not been, you know, completely defined, but basically what it is is a user interface that doesn't really adhere to the classic user interface paradigms. I mean, normally a lot of people are used to a start menu or, you know, a minimize button and all these different components. Now, GNOME kind of goes a different direction. So that causes a lot of controversy because some people just really don't like to, you know, gravitate away from those tried and true desktop paradigms. But I think GNOME is a great user interface. You just have to get used to it. So let me tell you a little bit about what I mean. Now, here we have a panel on the left side, which I actually like even though I don't use it, you can turn this off. I generally tend to turn it off for my use case, but I could definitely see that there would be value for a lot of people because, you know, it, it makes sense to have a panel on the left that shows applications that are open or your favorite applications. Now, this is not a standard GNOME item here. This is not present on the GNOME interface. GNOME is not specific to Ubuntu. This user interface is present on a lot of distributions. Debian, for example, ships with GNOME, and, sh and so does Fedora. They use more of a vanilla GNOME experience that's not going to have a panel like you see here on the left. I'm going to go ahead and double click on my name right here, which is going to bring up my home directory. And you'll notice on the left side where the file manager icon is, there's a dot next to it. There isn't a dot next to the others. That basically means that that application is currently open. 
So it's very similar to you know Windows 7 and uh, Windows 10 in that regard that you can have icons on your panel and just having the icon doesn't mean that it's open. It just means that you know it's a shortcut icon, but if you do open it, you'll get the dot. Now I can open a new instance of this application. You'll see that the title of the application is up here. That gives you a little sub menu. I could just go to new window. So I have two file manager windows open. And this application is known as Nautilus, which is the default file manager in GNOME. Same is true for Ubuntu, but it's simply shortened to files for you know, user simplicity. But you'll see that I have two dots on the left side. Uh, basically, that means that it's open more than once. Now, as far as the dock is concerned, one of the things that I like about Ubuntu is that they don't force this on you. Even though it's here on the left, you can turn it off or configure it. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Activities, and then I could just start typing Settings. And here I have the Settings app open. And then we're going to have an item here for Dock. This is specific to Ubuntu, so if you're running GNOME on a different distribution, you will not have this. So if I click on that, we have some customization. So I can basically change the icon size. I can make them a lot larger. I can make them a lot smaller. So if you feel like this panel takes up too much room on the screen, you can adjust it. I'm going to basically flip it back to default. But one thing I like to do is to turn this feature on to auto hide the dock. And basically what that's going to do is hide the dock when screen real estate is needed. So right now it's not hidden, you still see it on the left. It's not an automatic hide as far as you might be used to where it only shows when you put your mouse in that general direction. It actually is more of a dodge. So if I pull the window over here to the left, it gets out of the way. So it detects if something is near and then it gets out of the way. So you don't lose that screen real estate if you need it, but you have the panel there at all times. Otherwise, if you maximize, which you could do by double clicking, it goes away, and then you can see it comes back. And we have standard window controls here in Ubuntu 19.10. We have a minimize button, which works basically exactly as you would expect. This is not default in GNOME. You can turn it on in GNOME, but this is a customization that Ubuntu makes. Now you could choose which monitor you want to show this on. I could show this on the built-in display, which is my laptop screen, or I could show this on my external monitor. Actually, this is a screen recorder, not a real monitor, but if you prefer to have it on a specific screen, you can do that. And you could also change the position in general. So if you prefer to have it on the bottom or you prefer to have it on the right, you can do that. So what I'm gonna do now is show you guys around the GNOME desktop and how it works. Now we have something that says activities right here. Now if I click on that, it doesn't really do a whole lot right now because you know we don't have any applications open. Now if I was to open an application, so again just the file manager window here, and then I go to activities, you see that it is shown on the screen there. So another thing that I can do is I can open up LibreOffice, which is the default office suite. I'm going to go ahead and pull that away to not have that maximized. I'll go ahead and bring up the default browser, which is Firefox. And now I have multiple applications open. So if I click on Activities, it shows me all the applications that are open. And you can also activate the Activities screen by just hitting the Super key, also known as the Windows Logo key, depending on what kind of keyboard you might have. So if you simply press that one button, you get an overview of all the applications on your screen. And this is actually one of the things that I really do like about GNOME. Once you get used to this one key to access an overview of all the applications that are open, it's really hard to not have it. And one of the benefits here is, you know, I have LibreOffice open and, you know, it's covering up everything else and I want to get back to my file manager window. I could do Alt-Tab, which does work as it does in other desktop environments and other operating systems. But that's two buttons to press Alt-Tab. I could simply press the super key and then click on the file manager window, which, you know, again, I'm still doing two things, but I find it a very fast thing to go back and forth between my applications by pressing the super key and then clicking on the window that I want. It works very well. Now, another thing to mention here is how do you get to your application? So 
I'm going to go ahead and close, let's say, Firefox, which you can also close from the Activities menu by just clicking on the red X there. We can basically launch an application by simply going to the Activities Overview here, and we can start typing the name of the application we want to run. And I didn't even have to finish typing before it shows up right here, and then I can click on it. So if I didn't have an icon here on the left, because you know you can actually remove it from favorites. So uh, for example, I can remove this Amazon icon, which is just, you know, maybe I, I think Canonical, the developers of Ubuntu get a little credit for having this. It's not a big deal because you know you download this for free and it makes sense that they need to basically support their costs. But if you don't want that, and I definitely don't want that, you can remove it from your favorites, which basically makes it go away. And if you have something open, so I'll just go ahead and open help. And then I go back to the menu here, remove it from the favorites. The icon will still be there because the application is open, as you can see. But if I go ahead and close it, then it, it's gone. It's only going to show that if it's open. These are known as favorite applications. So again, you can press the super key to go to the activities overview. And I already mentioned that you can start typing the name of an application. But what if you don't know the name of the application or you just want to know what's installed? Well, on the bottom left, we have show applications. And this little button right here is not specific to Ubuntu. When you access the activities overview in any version of GNOME or implementation of the GNOME desktop, you'll still have this. And if you click on it, you have a list of all the applications that you have installed that are ready for you to use. So you'll see some applications that are here that I don't have on the menu. So for example, we have this solitaire game right here. So I can click on that and then it opens. And you don't actually have to go to the activity screen. I'm kind of used to doing that because in normal GNOME, that's what you have to do. But you can get to it right from the panel here on the side. And you'll have two different screens or, or basically you'll have multiple screens. I have two because I have more applications installed than will fit on one screen. So you get additional screens. So this is very similar to other platforms. So that's how we get through our applications. Now, if there is an application that you want to add to be a favorite, there's two ways that you can go about this. Now here I have this solitaire game open. I could simply right click and add it to the favorites. And that means if I close it, it's still going to be there. And then if I don't want it, I can simply remove it. But from the application screen, if I see that the application I want to add as a favorite is here, without even opening it, I could right click on it and add it to the favorites list. I don't have to open it first. So that's just something that we can do to customize this list. I think that's really awesome. But even more awesome is the implementation of workspaces in GNOME, which I actually think is the best implementation of workspaces of any desktop environment that we have today. And you know, some people may disagree with that. It's at least my favorite. So what do I mean by workspaces? So this is actually something that basically all operating systems have today, because if you have a desktop screen and you know, you've got like 20 different apps, it's really frustrating to switch between 20 different applications. So having them separated in different virtual desktops is useful. Windows 10 has this now, and Windows was the last holdout. I mean, we've had this concept in place in Linux for a very long time, actually the entire time. I've been using Linux, we've had this feature, and I've been using Linux since 2002. We've had it before Mac OS, and we've had it before Windows. Now everybody has it, so it's just one of those things that we come to expect. And essentially the way it works in most operating systems is you just open another virtual desktop and you can have different apps open on each and you can flip between the two. But the implementation in GNOME though is actually a little different. And by different, I mean very unique. I'll show you what I mean. So when you press super or you click on activities and go to the activities overview, you'll notice these two little squares on the right side, the rectangles right now, but they're kind of hidden there. And if you move your mouse over there, it basically shows the entire thing. And you can see that we actually have two virtual desktops. Now in GNOME, you always have one additional workspace than you actually need. So if I go ahead and click on this right here, 
it takes me to a blank desktop. And then I can hit the super key and I can go back to the first. But if I go to the second one, I can open an application here and it's going to be specific to this workspace. So I can go ahead and click on LibreOffice. And now that one is on that workspace. And you'll notice a third was added. If I click on the third, and then let's just say I open the trash folder here. Now there's a fourth. If I close this, one of the desktops goes away. So this concept is known as dynamic workspaces. You never have to create however many desktops you think you'll need. It basically makes sure you always have one empty desktop that you can use at all times. And one thing that's pretty cool, I'm going to go ahead and open the calculator to give you an example. And I'm going to go ahead and go back to my LibreOffice document. So let's just say, for example, I'm working on a project and I have, uh, I have to do some calculations or some addition or something. So I could just go ahead and flip over here to this workspace. And then I can start doing whatever calculations I'm doing. And then I can hit the super key and go back to my writer document. And I can put in here whatever I got from the calculator. Um, it's a contrived example, I know, but just work with me here. But even better is the concept that you can have an application on all workspaces. So if you right click the window border here, and then you go to always on visible workspace, what that's going to mean is that with every workspace you click on, that application is going to be there. And we know it's the same because it has the same numbers on there. So that's useful if I'm on this workspace and then I have the calculator, I can minimize it. And then I can flip to any workspace I want, go back to my LibreOffice document, and then I can simply bring it back up and then I can minimize it and I could bring it back to whatever workspace. So it's basically going to be completely independent of the workspaces. So this is useful, probably more useful if you're listening to music. We have Rhythm Box right here for music management that's built into Ubuntu. You could put your music collection in there. It basically reads from your music folder. And let's just say you're listening to music. Well, you know, maybe you don't want to go out of your workflow here to pause the song or skip, you could basically add this to all workspaces to allow you to pause or skip your tracks regardless of which workspace you happen to be on. Now, even better is that you can use keyboard shortcuts to flip between your workspaces. So, you know, I showed you you could hit the super key or you can click on activities and then click on the workspace you want but you could also hold down the super key and press page up or page down to go through your different workspaces without even having to go to the activities overview screen. This is the method that I generally use. And if I go here to Firefox, I can actually move this to a different workspace by holding the Windows key or the super key like we would if we were switching workspaces. Again, it's super slash Windows key page up, page down or whatever. But if you also hold down shift, it moves the active window up or down. So the window follows you as you go through your workspaces. So I can move Firefox here to the very end to have it on its own workspace. I could do that completely with keyboard shortcuts. I mean, yeah, I can go ahead and go to activities and I could just drag it to a workspace. That works, but I find it easier to hold down those two keys and then I can simply move it along right here with the super key with shift and then page up and page down. So that's one of the strong points of GNOME is that you can essentially control pretty much everything with keyboard shortcuts because if you don't have to take your fingers off the keyboard to reach for your mouse every time, you might find that you are more productive than you would be normally. Now another thing that you can do is create additional keyboard shortcuts. So I'll hit the super key here and then in settings under devices we have keyboard shortcuts. I can scroll all the way to the very bottom and I can click on the plus sign and I can give it a name so I'll call it terminal and then for the command I know the name of the application already so it's gnome hyphen terminal and the shortcut I'm going to set that to windows key and then T then I'm going to add it and now if I hold down super and press T 
a terminal appears. Now we already have a keyboard shortcut for this. So, um, you know, I basically added a, another keyboard shortcut when there was one already. We can hold Control Alt and press T. It does the exact same thing. But it's muscle memory for me. Uh, Windows key and then T is very simple. So that's generally what I do. And then, for example, if we wanted to add a shortcut for Firefox, which is the default browser, we just give it a name. The name is arbitrary, doesn't matter. Command is Firefox. I could do Windows key B. And if I want a new browser window, I hold down the Windows slash super key, press B. And there we go. I have a new Firefox window. And I did that without accessing the applications menu within activities. Um, I didn't have to do that because now I have a keyboard shortcut. And you can add a keyboard shortcut for anything you want so long as the keyboard combination you try isn't already taken by something else. So I have the settings app open right here. We can look into some customizations that we can make. So for example, Bluetooth. I don't have any Bluetooth devices I can add right now because they're all paired to other things, but if I did and it was in pairing mode, I could basically add my Bluetooth device here. But moving on, background allows me to select a different wallpaper. If I click on it, it sets it as the background, or I can set it as the background, but I can also set it as the lock screen. The lock screen, I don't think I'm going to be able to show you that because the screen recorder isn't able to capture that. But if your screen locks, there's a wallpaper, you can change it. So I could basically just set this as my desktop background, and you can see that works. And then if you scroll through here, you see all kinds of cool wallpapers that you can add. I'm just going to go ahead and set the default back to what it was. And we can change that. I've already showed you the dock. We can customize the notifications. If you don't want your notifications to show up on the lock screen, so for example, if you work at a company and you know communications about clients, for example, are private, you can disable this. You will not see notifications on the lock screen. You can also customize notifications for individual applications. So Maybe you don't want to disable lock screen notifications. You could disable individual apps that are driving you crazy. That's something that you can do. We have a search section. It will index your files. So that just makes it easier when you press the super key and you're basically looking for a file name. You can type it up here. I have no files, so I can't show you that. But essentially, if you did, you could actually search for files here in the activities overview and what types of files it uh, basically harvests for the index for powering that search. You can turn on or off here. So if your CPU fan is going absolutely crazy because you just added 10,000 MP3s and it's gonna take an hour to get through that, you could actually turn this feature off for a while and maybe resume it later. Region and language. We have a section here where you can change the language. If yours is something other than what it's set to currently, you can just simply click on this and your availability here of what options you have will depend on your selections during the installation. I just selected English, but um, you can actually install other language formats by clicking this right here. That's not something I'm going to go over. That's beyond the scope of this video. Universal access for those of you that need it. If you have any impairments of vision or you know something along those lines, hearing, or you need some kind of assistance to use your computer, you can turn on those options right here. We have a screen reader, we have Zoom, sound keys, and things like that. So if that's you, then you can, of course, activate that. And if you turn this on where it says always show universal access menu, then we get a menu up here in the top right corner where we can get to these things very easily. So. If uh, you benefit from any of these types of things, then this will be a way that you can get easy access to that assistance. Online accounts. If you have an account on any of these services, you can basically click on it, and then you can put in your credentials to go ahead and sign in. And basically what that's going to do is integrate that account with your GNOME desktop. That could be something like calendar notifications, email, things like that. You basically can go ahead and set that up. 
and all I have are personal accounts right now so I'm not gonna go ahead and try it but you know what just if you have a Facebook account Google what have you just go ahead and uh, sign in and see what happens and you might be surprised by how integrated it actually is we can configure privacy which means we can disable the screen lock if we don't like that we can configure location services, which is used by some apps, like for example, map applications. And we have other things that we can configure here, but uh, let's go ahead and move on. And then we have under applications, we can go ahead and go through here and see customizations for individual applications. And you're probably not going to use this very often if you need to set something as the default file type you can do that, but you know I'll leave that up to you if any of these options help you. Uh, a lot of these apps are not going to be very integrated into GNOME. I think a lot of these are here for future use, but you could go ahead and click on this and see if your applications have any uh, customizations that you can make. A lot of these will have the notification option here, but the file type defaults will probably make the most sense because you know, for example, Rhythmbox, we can uh, choose audio files and it's set to be the default for these and you can unset that if you don't like it. If you have a different application to manage your music, you can click on that application and then you can manage your file types there. We have sharing, so screen sharing and media sharing uh, beyond the scope of this video. Honestly, I've, I've never used this before, but that's kind of interesting. Sound settings allows you to choose your output device if you have a Bluetooth device or um, you know HDMI audio out, which you know it looks like I do. You can basically choose where your output goes, which speakers are responsible for your sound. Same for input. You know if you have more than one microphone, which I don't, you can select that here. You can select the input volume for your microphone, and you can adjust system sounds and system volume independently. And then we have power settings. So right here we can change the brightness. Obviously you're not going to see a difference because I'm recording the screen, but I, I see that the screen gets dimmer, brighter uh, as I adjust that. We can set it to dim the screen when inactive. We can, we're going to blank the screen in five minutes by default. So, you know, if you don't press anything for five minutes, then it'll go blank and lock. And you can go ahead and adjust that. We can turn Wi-Fi on or off and turn Bluetooth on or off. Automatic suspend by default is when it's on battery power. I'm on uh, AC, I got the power cord plugged in, so that's not going to affect me. Power button action, we can uh, change that. I prefer suspend, honestly, because I don't want it to shut down. Uh, I'd like to say power, but I don't want to shut it off at the same time. We have network settings, so you can configure different networks here beyond the scope of this video, but you can basically configure your network if your network provider or ISP has given you instructions that you need to change something. This is where you would change those values. Under devices, on the display section, we can customize our monitor output, basically. And I have it on mirror right now. I can't change it because the mirror is required for, for recording the screen. But I can also change the resolution, orientation, and things like that. So if you have multiple monitors, this is where you would configure that. We also have night light, which is going to change the color temperature at night to try to trick your brain into thinking it's sunset. But, you know, the light coming from a computer and it might make it hard for you to unwind. Uh, if that's you, you can basically configure that and turn that on. And then you can select the time period where that occurs. Keyboard shortcuts, I already mentioned. We have mouse and touchpad. We could change the primary button. The mouse speed I generally like to crank up. I do like to adjust natural scrolling because I'm used to that. And um, you know it's already the case with the touchpad, but I like that with the mouse wheel as well. That's what this is for. And then the touchpad speed, we can crank that as well. Enable or disable tap to click. Two finger scrolling, we can enable that. Edge scrolling is disabled by default. Personally, that always gets in my way. But if you like it, you can put that in. And then we have printers which um, surprisingly has detected my brother printer, which is awesome. That used to be a major pain to set up in Ubuntu, but in this release, I guess they must have fixed something because it's right here. We also have settings for what to do when we plug in removable media. And if you have a Thunderbolt port, which I don't, 
on your computer, then you can customize that here. But I think that's basically everything of value. The only other thing is details here on the main section, which gives you some details about your system. You can see the details on my test system. This is a lemur made by System76. We have the GNOME version right here. The graphics card, you can see how much memory I have, the type of processor, and the disk, and so on. And we can also check for updates. So how do you add new software applications? So I showed you how to switch between apps and things like that, but how do you install new ones? Well, we have Ubuntu software here on the left. And basically, if you want to install something, you just go ahead and choose a category. So I'll choose games. So we have some featured games here on the top. We have Minecraft installer. That's going to be probably pretty popular. But if what you want to install is not here, you can basically click on it wherever it is. Frozen Bubble is a great example. I think everybody should have that installed because it's an awesome game. So I'll do that and I'll install it. And we just put in the password. It's the same password that we use when we log in. And I'll go ahead and let that install. I'll be right back when it's done. All right, now it's installed and we can see that we have an option to launch the app. And now it is available in the applications menu as well. So I can go ahead and launch it. We can see Frozen Bubble. Really fun game, uh, wastes lots of time, but it's just plain awesome. It's just something that I usually like to install. It's just just a pure treasure of the Linux games. I think that this is amazing. It's a lot of fun. It's simple. Not the most highly graphical game in the world, but you know what? It doesn't have to be. We also have an option to remove it if we decide we don't want it after all. On the main screen here, we have installed, which allows us to remove anything that's currently installed. So if we wanted to actually get rid of Frozen Bubble, I don't know why the heck you'd want to get rid of it, but if you did, you just click on remove. Then remove again, type in your password, and it's going to go ahead and uninstall it. You can see that there is a one up here, and that just means it's a, a job. There's one job running. It puts it up here at the top. It says it's removing, and now it's gone. And then we also have updates. So this is where your system updates will be stored. So if you have any updates on your system, I mean, today's release day, so we don't, but I'm sure you will by the time you're seeing this video. You'll have a list of your updates here and you can go ahead and install those. And this right here will refresh. So let's just see what happens if I do that. But in my case, I really don't have any updates. It will refresh on its own. The only use for this button is if for some reason you just want it to do that quicker or you just want to get it done right now. But effectively, you'll get a notification when there are updates. Now, one important thing that I neglected to tell you and probably should have showed you earlier in the video is the controls at the upper right corner. So these controls right here give you easy access to adjusting your system volume, your screen brightness, changing your wireless network. So I could go ahead and select a network and it's connected to mine, which is the only one I really need right now. But if I wanted to switch it, I could do that. There's a Bluetooth menu. You have quick access to your power settings, which we went over earlier in the video. And then you have your user account listed right here. You can go to account settings, which is actually also in uh, the system settings. You could change your display name and your password and so on. And right here, you can actually get to settings in general. That just takes you to the settings app to no specific place. It'll default to the last thing that you have accessed. You have a power menu right here where you can restart or power off the system. And you also have a lock icon, which I'm not going to click on because you won't be able to see it. But if you wanted to lock your screen and step away from your desk, this is what you would click on to make that happen. Up here, we have basically a little calendar. It's not a full featured calendar, but if you signed into one of your online accounts, then you would have basically your calendar appointments listed here and you would get reminders for that. Now, notifications will appear here. I haven't received any yet, but if you had like an upcoming event or something like that, it might show you in any of your applications if they generate a notification, it will be stored here. 
So this is basically an information center. It's like your one-stop place for any uh, notification that you might receive, whether it's a calendar update or just something coming from an application, you will see a history of notifications right here. You'll also get an option to clear them when there actually are notifications here to clear. So there you go. That was my overview of Ubuntu 19.10. So hopefully that was helpful for you guys, whether you just want to get an overall look of the Ubuntu 1910 desktop or you're a beginner and you just want to know, you know, how the heck do you use Ubuntu? Hopefully this was helpful for you guys, regardless of your user case. So um, hope you liked it. And I have other videos in the works I'm really excited about. Can't tell you much right now, but definitely subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. I have some very exciting things coming up. So I will see you in the next video. Thanks for checking out my video. I really appreciate it. If you found it useful, click that like button. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe so you'll see the latest content as soon as it becomes available. If you want to help me out, there's links down below for my Patreon page, as well as links for purchasing my Linux books and also my affiliate store which has a listing of Linux compatible hardware that I've actually tested personally. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.